1494, someone you may have heard of, Leonardo da Vinci, began work on his famous painting, The Last Supper. So you've all seen that before, but what you may not know is that this painting was actually not done on canvas, like a traditional painting might be, but it was painted on the wall of a dining room in a monastery in <coughs> Milan. And so he was com commissioned to paint this um, on the wall, and it took like two to three years for him to finish. Um, the main reason is because his sort of sporadic nature of coming and going to paint this. So da Vinci would show up, and sometimes for maybe three hours, he'd just sit there and stare at the wall. Like he'd just sit there and not do anything, just contemplate it. Other times he would show up and make like two brush strokes and then leave. And other times he would actually get stuff done, like he'd get in there and paint and be very productive. But when he was asked about this, da Vinci said, well, the reason I do this is because inspiration and creativity, like, it's not something you can manufacture. It just kind of comes to you and you have to act on that. But because of the way he did this, some funny stories came out. So <laughs> one's about a monastery leader, this poor old guy. He was in charge of sort of the logistics and letting uh, Leonardo come in and making sure he had everything that he needed. And one story is that you know, after a few years of doing this, being just super annoyed, you know, he comes in towards the end of the painting and kind of hovering over Leonardo's shoulder and says, when are you gonna finish this thing? Like, is it done yet? Like, we're trying to get on with our life here in the monastery, you know? And da Vinci, like, looks at the painting when he's got done and he's like, you know what? All I need is to paint Jesus' face and Judas's face. And I can't find someone to sit for Judas and be that model. Um, do you think you'd be interested? That might solve both of our problems. Like, <laughs> could you sit and I model Judas after your face? And obviously the monastery leader was like, no. And he's walked out and never really bothered da Vinci again for the rest of the time. Because, I mean, could you imagine being the face of Judas on this painting? Like, good Lord, that'd be something to live with. That story has nothing to do with the sermon. Um, that's just funny. <laughs> so what, what does... <laughs> what is important for the sermon tonight is a little bit about the method of how da Vinci went about this. So there's this thing, if you're an art student or you know anything about art, that's called perspective. You can go up and put the next, yep, sweet. Perspective lines, a vanishing point, and a horizon line. If you know anything about this, this is essentially a way for artists to communicate realism into a painting. So. You would draw the horizon line, pick a vanishing point, and then make sure all of your objects and angles are going towards that point. And this just like mimics how we see things in real life, right? Like things are bigger when they're closer to us, they look smaller when they're further away. And the next photo, what's fascinating is that da Vinci chose Christ as the vanishing point on the horizon line. So all, you can see all the tapestry angles, everything about this photo is sort of going towards the figure of Christ. It's almost as if da Vinci's trying to say, Christ is the center of this painting, of this scene. And like us as viewers, we see it like that too, right? There's chaos going around. It's probably when Jesus said that one of them was gonna betray him and everybody's freaking out about that, like who's it gonna be? They're probably arguing about who's the greatest amongst the disciples, that happened. But we focus on Christ because he's in the center of this painting and da Vinci made it that way. What's even a crazier step in the next photo is that on this wall, he also positioned it to where all of the angles of the walls in this dining room also went towards that same vanishing point, towards Christ. So when you'd come in to view this, all the walls, the windows, everything you're seeing is pointing you towards Christ. And one more story comes from this really quickly. The, this one's a little bit harder to verify historically, so take it with a grain of salt, but I still think it's fun. At the end of him finishing this, he invited the public in, and there's a story of a man who came in there while da Vinci was in there, and he was looking at it, admiring it, and he said, da Vinci, my goodness, this is so good, so detailed, like, look at the detail in this cup. And the story goes that da Vinci grabbed a paintbrush and ran over and like covered up the cup real quick and painted over it and said, no, focus on Christ, not the cup. Like that's not the point of this. And so I think we're gonna see as our text today backs up that da Vinci's thoughts about presenting Christ as the center is correct. Christ is the center and the gift of the Lord's Supper. 
So here's where we're going. I want us to dig into the institution of the Lord's Supper in Luke. I want us to look at what is offered to us and how we're to receive that which is offered. And I think a good way to do this is like in Matthew's gospel, Jesus uses the language of take and eat to initiate the Lord's Supper. This is a helpful way to view the two realities of the Lord's Supper. So take, Jesus is offering something to us. He says take. Eat, we must act to receive what is offered to us. We have to do something. And so I believe what Luke is saying is that what is offered to us is beauty, truth, and goodness embodied in Christ Jesus himself. And we're to receive Christ by contemplating beauty, truth, and goodness while taking of the meal. So let me say it one more time. I believe what Luke is trying to say is what is offered to us is beauty, truth, and goodness, which is embodied in Christ himself. And we're to receive Christ by contemplating those things, beauty, truth, and goodness, while taking of the meal. So my hope, my prayer for us tonight is that we're able to freshly taste and see the sweetness of Christ. And then we begin to see the unique grace and communion that is offered to us at the table every Sunday. So let's start with this take, this perspective of what is offered to us. The first is beauty. Verses 14 and 15 say, when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So in, in order to see the beauty of the Last Supper, we need to quickly understand a little bit about beauty. Beauty is that kind of hard thing to pin down. It's hard to describe. We just kind of like know it when we see it. But one characteristic that is essential to beauty is this idea of fittingness. So fittingness just simply means like how things rightly fit together, how things are suitable for each other, it's, it's a pleasing thing to us when we see something that's fitting. We might say something is beautiful because it seems right. It's fitting. It makes sense. Philosopher Roger Scruton suggests that experiencing beauty is actually recognizing a form of fittingness or harmony. And this not only applies to like art, like the Last Supper, but it also applies to ordinary things. So things like a living room arrangement. We might like go into someone's house and say, it's just right how you placed everything. Like, it's so fitting that you would put those things in that order. We might say the same thing about, like, a musical refrain, something that sounds pleasing to the ear. Like, it, it all fits together. It feels right. So we use this in everyday language, too. This seems abstract a little bit, but we might say something like, it's fitting that Argentina won the World Cup because it was Lionel Messi's last World Cup. I do air quotes because he might play again. We'll see. <laughs> but if it was, like, that, it's fitting that he would win, right? Like, that just seems right. Like, one of the best players of all time to go out on a win. It just seems fitting to us. And in the Bible, we actually see this a lot as well. We see this in prophecies and symbolisms, things that, like, you might have projected in the Old Testament and then come to be realized in the New, and we're like, man, that is, that's so right. That's fitting. It's pleasing. It's beautiful. So in order to see the beauty that's offered to us in the Lord's Supper, we gotta take a look at what Passover is. That's the key word there, right, in verse 15. He says he's desired, desired to eat this Passover meal with them. And we're also gonna see the idea of a sacred meal that God has completely made us um, privy to throughout redemptive history. So let's go all the way back to Genesis 2 real quick. We're back in Genesis. And God is creating the world. He creates the world and then he creates man and woman to live and to tend to God's creation. Immediately after this, he creates, um, immediately after he creates humanity, he then plants a garden. And in this garden, it says that God caused to grow out of the ground every tree pleasing in appearance and good for food. God then takes man and woman that he's created, puts them into the garden, and says, eat of the fruit of the trees there except for the tree of knowledge and good and evil. So this is our current situation. God has created, he's fellowshipping with humankind in the garden, walking with them, and he celebrates this by offering them a meal. He instructed them basically, 
participate in this relationship in my life through the joy of eating and drinking. We see this incredible reality that from the very beginning, God values and plans to relate to his creatures with a meal. That's wild. I don't know why it just hits me as like crazy, but it is insane to me that like God has put this type of emphasis on eating and drinking. So fast forward to Exodus now and to the Passover. Israel, God's chosen people, are enslaved and stuck in Egypt. God uses Moses along with signs and a plague and different wonders to try to convince Pharaoh to let his people go. We know the story, right? The last sign, the last plague, is death. So to protect the children of Israel, God gives instructions. He says to the Israelites, cover your doorposts with the blood of a sacrificial lamb. And so when the angel of death passes over, he'll see that blood and he will continue to pass over that household. Hence, pass over. And during all of this, all of this kind of chaos and instruction and fear that I'm sure they're experiencing, the Lord installed a meal for the entire nation of Israel. So this meal was to be prepared by slaughtering and eating of a lamb and of unleavened bread. God said the sacred meal would be for the whole nation as a memorial for them and that they must celebrate it throughout the generations. So God establishes this meal, uniting his people around a common table and a common food and says, repeat this throughout the ages. Theologian Robert Barron says, this Passover meal in a word was a recovery, however imperfect, imperfect, of the easy unity and fellowship of the Garden of Eden. God hosting a banquet at which his human creatures share life with him and each other. So we're starting to see this pattern, right? And one final meal quickly I want us to look at in the Old Testament is found in the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah gives us this image of God's holy mountain, this picture, and it's called Zion. This mountain is pictured as being a place where people will gather together in unity and worship God. And what is the core feature there? A banquet, a sacred meal. Isaiah 25, 6 says, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine, well refined. So in Isaiah's vision, God is graciously providing a banquet full of the finest food and drinks for his gathered community. Again, calling back this idea of Eden where he's perfect unity, fellowshipping in a meal. And now we come to the New Testament and to Jesus. So, so far we've been seeing how the God of all creation desires this banquet, the sacred meal. And so, we should not be surprised at all to see Jesus, the image of the invisible God, making a sacred meal the central point of his ministry. Right, like this is what our whole sermon series is, Table Talks. We've been looking at how Jesus is going to mills, coming from mills constantly. He's inviting people in unity around the table constantly. It's sinners, tax collectors, government officials, all these people. And we're beginning to get a glimpse of the beauty of all this. Like, isn't it so beautiful? Isn't it so satisfying, so suitable that Jesus would make this a pivotal part of his ministry on this earth? And then we come to the Lord's Supper. The culmination of all of Jesus' earthly meals. And this is where we see the beauty on full display. Jesus Christ brings his disciples, his people, around a new Passover meal. As we will see, this is one that will not be marked by the slaughtering of a Passover lamb, but will be marked instead by the slaughter of the Lamb of God himself. And by extension here, what is crazy about this is that this meal is offered to us as well as God's people. And a step further, God doesn't just casually want to share this meal with us. Verse 15 says, he fervently desires... Another way you can say that is deeply longs to eat this meal with his disciples and then by extension, us. Commentator Robert Stein, talking about this fervently desired uh, language, he says, this translation is preferred. I, talking about Jesus, 
We're speaking from Jesus here. I have looked forward to sharing the joy of eating the Passover with you to teach you of the new covenant in my blood and to bring my work to conclusion. This is what Christ is essentially saying. And let's don't remove Christ from the Trinity, okay? Let's, let's follow this. Like, God himself longed to have this meal with us. Christ, the second person of the Trinity, fully God himself. This means God is fulfilling this idea of the sacred meal, longing to have this with us. The almighty God longs to share this meal with us, the Lord's Supper. Isn't that beautiful? Again, all calling back the Genesis, Eden situation, perfect unity, walking in relationship with God. So to summarize all this, Christ offers us a seat of participation in this beautifully, divinely orchestrated, sacred meal. And with this beauty in our minds, we can now turn to truth and see how truth is also offered to us in sacred meal. So, Truth starts in verse 16 and goes through 18. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So what does all this mean? Jesus is making some pretty big reality-changing truth statements here, right? Like, we need to interpret this and figure out kind of what this means. First, when Jesus says it, we need to interpret what it is. When he says that, I tell you, I'll not eat of it again. If we take verse 15 in our context here, he says he desires to eat the Passover meal with us, so the it has to be referring to the Passover. So, the Passover then, Christ claims, is going to be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Do we see that? He says, I'll not eat of it again, not eat of the Passover again until it's fulfilled. So the implication here is that the Passover will be fulfilled at some time, this historical meal that the Israelites have practiced for ages. Our next question, when is it fulfilled? When is this time? Well, if we connect all these dots and we use the rest of the New Testament Um, as supporting evidence, we see that what Christ is about to do, his death on the cross, that is the fulfillment of the kingdom of God when Passover is fulfilled. And the apostle Paul thought this too. Like, this is the guy that's raised in the Jewish religion, taught all of the customs who definitely practiced Passover constantly. And he says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. That's pretty wild. That's a statement right there for, for Paul to sort of substitute the normal Passover meal with Jesus, the Passover lamb. And so from now on, Christ's sacrifice is taking the place of the typical Passover lamb that's slaughtered. And by doing so, he's instituting a new Passover, the Lord's Supper. And the, the fulfilling of the Passover It also entails the fulfilling of the old covenant. I just want you to see that quickly. The reality of the new covenant is instituted in this meal. Because Christ will go on to say in a couple of verses, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. So Jesus, by fulfilling the Passover meal and instituting a new Passover based on his sacrifice, he's also instituting a new present reality. And I think this is the kicker right here. The new reality is one in which God's people, us, relate to God, not based on any sacrifice that we have made, but on the sacrifice once and for all made by Christ our Lord. Like This is the new covenant, right? Do we see that? That's the truth, that's the present reality that we are offered in this meal. But not only does Christ institute this new present reality, He also reveals the truth about a future heavenly banquet. In both verses 16 and 18, Christ is anticipating a future sacred meal with his people. Um, He says he will eat again with us in the kingdom of God. And this calls us back to that Isaiah vision of being on the holy uh, mountaintop where everyone's in unity eating this banquet. 
And this sacred meal is one that will be eaten for all of eternity. It's the meal that this Lord's Supper that we take every Sunday looks forward to. Revelation 19.9 says, Blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. So, in the Lord's Supper, truth is offered to us. It's a new, present reality, and it's realized in the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf, and it looks forward to a new future reality. And so, the question we have to ask is, how do we access this new reality that's offered to us? And that leads us to goodness. Verses 19 through 20, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So we find goodness here offered to us through the perfectly good act of Christ dying for our sins. What's interesting about this is, this is the first time that Jesus specifically refers to his upcoming death as being for his people. Up until this point, Jesus has, yeah, he's predicted his death multiple times, but he hasn't said specifically what it's for or who it's for until we read these words now. This is my body given for you. This cup is poured out for you. The disciples for the first time learn that Christ's about to be broken body and shed blood is for them to grant them and all who believe entrance into the new reality and that future heavenly banquet. And I feel we we need to see this, this moral act of love that Christ does for us. We need to understand this and feel this. He steps in as a substitute for us. Like the closest analogy to this would be to imagine a judge who's about to hand down a life sentence to a man who committed murder, and the judge steps in to serve that life sentence for the murder. Like, I doubt that's ever happened in the history of humankind, but even if it has, that would not even be close to what Christ did with his moral act of goodness on the cross. Christ, this innocent lamb of God, offered himself up to be slaughtered for us, We see this in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And Romans 5, 8 through 9 says, but God proves his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him? See, the judge in that analogy that I gave, he's not... He's not innocent, it's not the same. That judge is a sinner like me and you, but Christ, the innocent lamb of God, stepped in as a substitute for us sinners. And church, we need to constantly, constantly be reminded of the weight of this. I feel like when we become a Christian, we feel this, we do. That's kind of what that conversion feels like. We recognize this for the first time. But as we go along, we're in danger of forgetting the weight of this. We're in danger of losing sight of the substitute, the good act that Christ did. And that's one main purpose of this meal, right? Christ says in the same verse, do this in remembrance of me. Or more specifically, maybe, do this in remembrance of what I have done for you. Like, I will never forget one Sunday here, shortly after we began, we started coming up to the front to do communion like this after COVID, And I believe uh, Preston was serving the cup at the time and he looked at me like right in the eyes and said, Christ's blood shared for you, Lucas. (laughs) I was fighting back tears then just as I am now, like I almost bawled my eyes out right there on the spot. Like, what is this? What is this love that Christ has shown us? Like, I can't understand it. It's too good. Sometimes we, we remove the personal aspect of Christ's death when we, we just talk about Jesus dying for the world, which is not a bad thing, but we, we make it this abstract, like he died for the world, some group of people out there. But if you're a Christian, Christ purchased you. 
Like you on the cross, you individually sitting in these seats. Do we feel that? Do we feel that when we come and take communion every Sunday? Christ offers himself to us. Beauty, truth, and goodness that's offered to us in this meal, it's embodied in Christ Jesus. Christ says that this bread and this cup is his body and his blood. John 6, 48 says, Jesus makes this profound statement, I am the bread of life. And so we do need to quickly wrestle with the how of Christ being offered to us in this meal. Like his disciples had to wrestle with this too. After this John 6 statement, they said, Jesus, this saying is hard. Like, what do you mean? Eat of my flesh. I'm the bread. What, do you, what does this mean? And so we are also wrestling with that. We're, we're, we're dealing with that in a way. What does it mean to take the bread, and that's Jesus? Two things I want to say. First, I think something that is inescapable and that is the thing we know for sure is that we fellowship with Christ through taking the Lord's Supper. This is the reason it's called communion, right? Communion, to commune with someone is to intimately and deeply fellowship with them. And Paul gives us very precise language on this in 1 Corinthians 10. He says, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The blood we, or sorry, the bread we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? This is a powerful Greek word used here for shared. It is koinonia. The word is commonly used in the New Testament to refer to deep, intimate fellowship. And there's actually so many ways in which <clears throat> this word finds its meaning and its origin in the Lord's Supper. We don't have time to draw all that out, but just what you can leave with, what you need to know is that it's a very specific word used to convey communion with Christ and also used to convey communion with believers. And so we're offered this type of fellowship with Christ every time we come to the table. Hear this, this isn't empty symbolism, what we do on Sundays, okay? This is not empty and devoid of any meaning. That, would, that view would not account for what Jesus and Paul are trying to say. So Christian, if you're coming to the table on Sundays and you're treating it as mere symbolism or just a boring religious rite that you have to do and you know you're supposed to do it, I feel like you're completely missing out on some deep fellowship that's offered to you there. So that's something we can say for sure. It's fellowship with Christ. But how much more can we say about the bread and cup we partake in? And I want to offer a second principle, which is live into the mystery. There's been so many theories throughout history of how Christ is present in the meal. Some have said he's under the bread. Some have said he's above the bread. Some have said he's in the bread. Some have said he's like spiritually present while we're taking it. But I think the Bible doesn't give us specifics. It doesn't give us enough to to build some perfect category for what is happening here. So I think it's fine to both know that we are experiencing fellowship with Christ, but also be okay not fully understanding how it all works, right? That's that mystery we can live into. And C.S. Lewis is helpful here. After talking about the benefits offered to us in the Lord's Supper, he said this about its mystery. The command, after all, is take, eat, not take, understand, Particularly, I hope I need not be tormented by the question, what is this? This wafer, this sip of wine, that has a dreadful effect on me. It invites me to take the this out of its holy context. It's like taking a red coal out of the fire to examine it. It becomes a dead coal. I think Lewis is wise here. I don't think we need to come to the table worried and over-analytical about all the spiritual and metaphysical properties that are happening in the bread and cup. Like, that's not the purpose. That's fine to think about with your friends or, like, go home and, like, study that or have good conversations about that. That's great. But when we come here on a Sunday, all we need to do is come and take, eat, and enjoy Christ. So, beauty, truth, and goodness, it's offered to us in the form of Christ himself, we embrace the mystery of the sacred meal and we receive it. And this leads us to the application 
of all this, which is how are we then to receive it? So the eat portion. To partake of this meal requires work on our end. Remember from the start, Jesus has offered us something. We've seen that. Now we gotta take it. And I think a primary way that we do this is through contemplation. So what I mean by contemplation is like prayer, meditation, reflection, all those sort of like mental and spiritual practices fit under this idea of contemplation. So let's start with how we contemplate beauty in the meal. If God has set up a sacred meal with us as a main way of fellowshipping with his people and he's longed to share this meal with us, then we should also long to share this meal with Christ. And a really practical way that that works itself out is you gotta show up on Sundays to take it. <laughs> like, we take communion every Sunday here, and if you're longing to experience this meal, like, come to the service. Come join in on this fellowship. Come take the meal. And so that's a good way to check, like, is your heart longing to experience Christ in the meal every Sunday? And I don't wanna make it sound like that's easy. Like, sometimes we do show up here and we still don't feel it, you know? It's not that easy to, like, just have manufactured affections for Christ, but ask yourself, what can you do to stoke those affections? How can you contemplate beauty and the desire for fellowship with Christ? I wanna to point to one thing. I think this is something that's really passionate to us uh, leaders at Storyline, but the order of our service is meant to prepare you for the Lord's Supper. That's why we call it the height of our service. Josh gets up here every Sunday and says this is the height of our service. The music isn't the height. The sermon is definitely not the height. The meal is central to our service and all other pieces seek to serve the meal. So the, the music can be beautiful. The sermon can be beautiful. But it's all pointing towards the meal. Puritan Thomas Watson says this about the word of God in particular. He's talking about how the word and the sacrament or the Lord's Supper work together. He says, the word brings us to Christ and the sacrament builds us up in him. The word is our fount where we are baptized with the Holy Spirit, but the sacrament is the table where we are fed and cherished. So let the singing and the preaching of the word prepare your hearts to be fed and nourished at communion. So those are some ways we can contemplate beauty, but we can also contemplate truth. We should contemplate our new reality in Christ. Contemplate the new covenant. Pray in thanksgiving about being in the new covenant. This is the covenant that we've seen already that we've been brought into by Christ, and we should be thankful and meditating and reflecting on the fact that we don't have to make sacrifices for ourselves to try to cover our sin. That's what we should do. Instead, we take a step forward and we reap the benefits of Christ's gratuitous sacrifice on our behalf. And along with this, a really beautiful part of this is that we can meditate on the fact that we are all family, united under the name of God's people. Like when you're coming to take communion, look around the room. Look at the lines that are forming, the amount of people that are coming up here each time to enjoy sweet fellowship with Christ. You have fellowship with those believers, too. That's what we say in the passing of the peace, right? We have fellowship with each other. And we, we have such sweet, sweet community here I'm, in the universal church at large, but also specifically at Storyline, like enjoy each other. We can also contemplate our, that future present, or that, sorry, that future reality, which is the wedding feast of the Lamb that future banquet that we will be attending when we behold the face of Christ when all things are made new. Meditate on what a glorious reality that will be. And lastly, we can contemplate goodness. We should contemplate that sacrifice. When the volunteers serve you communion and they say, Christ's body broken for you, think about that. Like, take a moment Go back to your seat and sit and think about that. Think about Christ dying on the cross for you personally. It will humble you. It will. It'll bring you joy as well. It'll help you fight sin. Like, I think there's life transformation that's available for those who consider the perfect moral act of Christ. This is something that we could not do ourselves, right? 
So contemplate beauty, truth, and goodness, and ultimately Christ himself. And don't feel overwhelmed by this list, okay? Don't feel like there's guilt involved if you can't perfectly contemplate all those things. That's not the point. It's, it's not easy to, again, like we said, not easy to get into that mindset and have those affections stoked, but I wanna present that as options that are available to you every Sunday, a way that you can taste and see Christ at the table. And I just wanna close with a poem from the poet and priest George Herbert. In this poem, he's personifying love as a character who's ultimately Christ, and he's imagining Christ welcoming in someone to a meal, and that person's feeling guilty of their sin. So just soak this in and imagine the reality of Christ at the table when I read it. Love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful, ah, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame, my dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste of my feast. So I did sit and eat. Church, let's taste and see the Lord, that he is good by coming to the table, experiencing beauty, truth, and goodness of Christ and his sacrifice that is offered to us. Let's pray.